Welcome back to another episode of the Girl Stop Playing Podcast. It's your favorite homegirl, Coriel, here to encourage you to stop playing with your potential and start working for what you want in life and in love. You already know that I'm bringing you the information and the conversations to help you make the money and get the honey. You can have it all as long as you are willing to work. And today we have a working woman in the building. We have Dr. Loren Joseph yes. in the hey, studio. Hey, hey, Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here. So for y'all that don't know, Loren is the Jamaican pronunciation of Lauren. Okay, we real basic over here. Okay, y'all are fancy with Loren. Now, every time I have someone of Jamaican descent on my show, because I consider myself to be Jamaican, mm -hmm. I always ask for a patois lesson. Okay, all right. You ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, help me. Yeah, just uh, so just in greetings, just at Wapm or Wagwan. 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 Yeah. <laughs> I Better. did too much. It's like wa. 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 Yes, so there's an inflection. Wa. 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 Wagwan. Wagwan. Mm -hmm. Or why you depan. I'm, I'm sorry? <laughs> That's just another <laughs> wait, way. Why you depan. Okay, don't like, tell me what it means. Mm -hmm. What? Say it again. Why you depan. Why you depan. Yeah, that's what like. What the hell does that mean? Like, what's up? It's just, it's just what, very, very. What's pon? Because I hear that a pun, lot. Pon, pon, pon means on. Like, it's like, what are you on? Would be the literal translation of it, but it's like, what's up? Okay, do another one. Do another phrase. Okay, like, um, in so, um, in terms of what? Well, mm -hmm. let me tell you what confuses me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Y'all lose me when you do the the me and the fee. Yeah. What does that mean? Okay, so fee is for and fa also means for but it depends on the context See, that, that you the use point. it in yeah point. yeah so it's like if a fa is at the end of a sentence and feet would be in the middle of a sentence Okay, yeah. now you all see why yeah. I get a lesson every single time yeah. and I still am back at square one yeah. I, I'm sorry. like why why they go over this so far or why they look over this so far would be why are you looking over there? You know, for what reason are you looking what over there? What are you looking over there for? Mm -hmm. Okay, say it again. Say the sentence Where again. Where the look over the sofa? Girl, there is no... <laughs> there is literally no way I would have gotten that from that. Yeah. But that is why yeah. I am still yeah. at square one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we did not do that. I'm going to stick to Spanish. Um, okay, so Dr. Loren, yes. I, you have done so much reading your bio, preparing for this conversation. I'm like, oh my God, where do I start? So where I would like to start is your start, your yeah. professional start with mental, in the mental health space. Yeah. So talk to me about what did you study in school that led to Yeah, that so space? I have a master's and specialist degree in mental health counseling. Okay. And when I started my career in mental health, I was actually working with youth who were involved in the juvenile justice system. And so I had to go into homes. That was the, my, my job. I had to do home visits and provide the counseling services in home. And so as I was visiting these homes, I started to s notice a lot of connecting threads, the similar challenges that people faced, many of them who looked like me. And you know, as an immigrant, my experience as a black person was different than the experience I've had in the United States. And so it really started to interest me in um, you know, the, the social determinants and structural determinants that impact the outcomes that black people face and so yeah I'll, I'll stop there so what is the biggest difference because I've said this before I know y'all be feeling some type of way when I say it but I'm just basic black mm -hmm. don't have any connections to any any family outside of this country mm -hmm. I can't speak patois I don't have an accent I'm just basic black yeah I'm always so intrigued by the experiences of those of you that have roots that can yeah. pinpoint your people. And you just mentioned like your experience as an immigrant is much different from a yeah. black person that was born in America. What's the main difference? You know, I can say the strongest difference that I had as a child growing up in my formative years was representation. I didn't lack representation. Right. So my teachers were black, the dentist was black, the doctor was black, the 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 guy who was a pickpocket was black. So, so when on you, every when, level so they were black. They were, they, yeah. So, so when you're looking, you, there was always an example that you could reach for at the highest heights. You know. So, um, and then coming to the United States, the first school that I went to, I was the only black person in my class. Mm. And so that had to be culture shock. Yeah, yeah. And and I, I really started to learn what blackness 
meant because then I started to think back, oh, this girl who I went to high school with, she was white because there, there wasn't any basis of understanding. It was more cerebral. Okay, we know this, the, the slave ships, there was, um, you know, enslavement of people in the Caribbean. So I, it was like in the books, but then now coming to a place where there was um, systemic oppression that uh, I, I, I noticed, that, you know, over time, uh, I'm like, wow. It's, so I'm, slavery, I'm had, slavery affected us much differently. Yes, yeah, I, what, would, say, I would say What so. is the perception or how is slavery viewed in Jamaica versus here? You know, I, um, there was, we learned about slavery and I can talk about my experience and my interpretation because we're not a, you know, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. homogenous group. Yeah. People will have different experiences. But when I was raised, I knew that there were, um, these were my forefathers and what I learned about was the strength that we had as a people. And we, I, I learned that we were capable of anything. So there was no arbitrary limit that I couldn't cross. And I grew up believing that. I believed that I could be anything I wanted to be. I could be anyone I wanted to, to be. And I didn't question that. And so in Jamaica, we have this saying, we look about with talawa. Right, and it means that we are small, but we are mighty. And even as I'm saying it, I'm getting goosebumps because that that was just the 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 way. It's almost an indoctrination, uh, a good indoctrination, because you you realize the beauty in your people. So you know, not everybody is like that. My family was strongly like that, and um, the the you know my just just the, the core area where I navigated was like that. And I think it really influenced how I still move through the world today. It's so crazy how the, the literal same exact experience, depending on how you view it, is going to dictate like what you get out of it and mm -hmm. how that affects you. So you all take strength from it. Like if we could get through this mm -hmm. terrible thing, unimaginable thing yeah i can do anything yeah in america it's more so or it can be it can lead to like the victim mentality yeah. like we are so set back because of this thing that we've been through like right. we are starting from a deficit we are starting beneath you know other cultures yeah. because of what we've been through versus a sign of strength like yeah. because we've been through this if my ancestors can do that it ain't nothing yeah because that i'm dealing with that i can't do if you just look at at um how people evolve mm -hmm. we are here because our forefathers survived the middle passage mm -hmm. survive don't let me get started miss <laughs> coriel don't let I me i love that though because know? it's like a, a a story of strength and yes. survival versus like this victim story right. of right so we have the genes of the people who were able to withstand all sorts of atrocities and and that's in us yes it's in us yes. too so we can tap into it i think another thing that i've seen and i think you're kind of um uh, referencing this as well in in Jamaica it's not like we're black people it's like we're Jamaicans yes mm -hmm. and and you know there's some people who will say well Jamaicans think they're not black and I haven't found that to be true you know there's there's a whole colorism thing that goes on well you know that's that's um, another day's conversation that is alive and well in some segments of the community but we are we are taught to be proud of our heritage and so when we claim Jamaica it's not that we're abandoning blackness it's that Jamaica it, it flows through our veins you know we we no matter no no matter where we go Jamaica is our home mm -hmm. and so we we represent loudly so i follow an asian lady on instagram i know who you're talking you know about. who i'm talking yeah, about she, she rubs so, people the wrong way <laughs> so again i'm just american mm -hmm. this same experience what i what i'm about to say when i went to mexico and i saw asians like mexican asians that was a, a yeah a, my mind was blown same thing with this lady but her whole thing is i'm not an Asian woman in Jamaica, I'm a Jamaican. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to, to us in America, that's just a foreign concept because we identify you're this, you're that, you right. are American, but you're a Native American, yeah. you're an Asian American, mm -hmm. you're African American, yeah. you're a Mexican American. It's not like we're just all American. Right. And, I, and, I, and I imagine that that has 
had a positive Im impact on yeah, you. Yeah, now I've seen as though, when I grew up in, in Jamaica, there was one, t one TV channel, and um, people might look back at that and think that it was a bad thing. I think that when, when you're exposed to a broader swath of the universe and you start being exposed to, to um, different things, there's good and there's bad from that. And I think one of the things that has... Um, Fil filtered into some segments of, um, you know, from my perspective, uh, is is that there's there's now this um, need to attach uh, an, ethnic an ethnicity. Mm -hmm. to That's the, how you have to identify, yeah, right? Yeah, and and that wasn't. I was raised as a Jamaican, and then we were taught out of many one people, and you know, so um, the Asian people went were were largely moved to Jamaica to become indentured servants back in the day mm -hmm. too, and so yeah, so there are many different um, nationalities of people who are in Jamaica. Certainly, the the population that are African descendants are the largest group. So is there a concept of interracial dating in Jamaica? Like, is that a thing? No. You, so you, if you, as a Jamaican that's descendants came from Africa, marry someone that's descendants came from Asia, you are obviously different ethnicities, but it's not seen that way. It was, it's not, it's not, there's not this sense of it like it is in the United States where, you know, we look and say, so I couldn't go find a black woman or you know it's like couldn't couldn't this person have found a, a black woman so it, it, it's not like that what what my experience and understanding has always been that there is a a thread of classism that exists and so depend on your money and whether you live on the hill or you know you, th then then that, that becomes a matters. factor that gotcha. becomes a factor and so yeah so how did that, or did that affect? Because when did you move here? How old when were I was you? thirteen years old. Mm -hmm. Ooh, mm -hmm. sweet spot in yeah. life, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Wow. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, so how did that, or did that affect you dating here? I just knew, just the way that I was set up, that I was gonna, it was gonna, it was gonna have to be a Jamaican person, <laughs> just because. But could it have been an Asian Jamaican? Well, I like I, 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 I like black men. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for me, it, it could have, but it just where my eyes naturally fall um, gotcha. wasn't that, you know. So, you know, we're attracted to who we're, we're attracted to. But I knew that it would be a Jamaican person because there's a lot to explain otherwise. That part. I literally, for years, like a decade, my hairstylist was, um, it, I have locks now under this wig, so I don't go to her any, as often as I used to, but she's Jamaican, and she complained to me one time, like, if if you don't eat fish heads, yeah. I just can't, I'm not <laughs> explaining this anymore, and if you look at me like this is disgusting, this is not gonna work, like, yeah. this is who I am, I'm not gonna stop eating this, so I can very much yeah, yeah. understand yeah, it's, that. Yeah, the whole fish, I mean, That's if you talk to mommy, mommy will tell you that the fish cheek is is the sweetest part of the fish like oh, ask me the cheek of the fish like, like I, I look at her like okay you know but listen when i'm at a restaurant and i see that red snapper coming off yeah. coming across and it, and the eyeball is looking up yeah. at me i'm just like that's where yeah, I, we, I chop it off but i use it to make fish tea though what is fish tea is that what we call fish soup i was gonna but, say okay wait a minute you're not sipping but i guess you kind of still are yeah yeah, wow. it, it's, it, yeah we call it fish tea in jamaica with you would call it fish soup, soup but jamaicans call it fish tea. interesting see, okay. that's, it's a whole heap of things that yeah you like i'm not about to explain all of this to you so you need to come get with the program that makes sense okay so you got here you mm -hmm. studied um you got both of the, your, your degrees, started working with children. Mm -hmm. What were some of those things? Because we often have these conversations about how adults relate, yeah. and it always leads back to your childhood. Yes. What were some of those consistent things, those common denominators that you were seeing that's like, okay, we, t we hear the statistics of growing up in a single parent home. Yeah. We like What were some of those things that you were saying? It was people who were precariously housed, people who were moving from couch to, to couch, individuals who um, couldn't, you know, they couldn't make the rent, the, make the basic needs. And when you look back through the parental line, you'd see a lot of abuse. There was a lot of individuals who were sexually abused or um, in relationships where there were, was violence. Or you had individuals whose... Um, caretakers were absent because they were incarcerated and so a lot of these factors that you you see are what are called adverse childhood experiences aces and 
it really impacts how individuals see the world and how they move through the world. And so sometimes when we look at it, or individuals who have been fortunate enough to not have to navigate some of those challenges in life, look at it and, and feel, why is it that they're still stuck? And this happened a long time ago. When you are um, negative, when you are harmed at a time in your life when, when nurturing is, is what is most important, then it creates a, a, a break, mm -hmm. you know? And so when we talk about um, like arrested development, you know, you know, not the, the group arrested development, but you see some people whose development stops at the time of the trauma. Mm -hmm. And so now they're navigating the world as a 30 and 35 year old woman, but they are really a 12 year old child because the concerns, the issues that they faced at that time have not been resolved. There was no opportunity to resolve it. And so that was the connective threads uh, that I saw, particularly in, in um, individuals who are living in poverty, but even people who were wealthy, the ones who were in the juvenile justice system, they, there, were, um, there was a pattern of trauma also present in their lives. Interesting, because you would think or so many people think, you know, when you can give your kid everything, you know, they they have everything. Mm -hmm. Why would they have any issues? Like, I've paid for everything. I've yeah. provided everything. And that is not always, yeah. like, the most important, the utmost. That's because what's going to Because the strong you. bonds, you know, strong bonds, nurturing bonds cannot be developed in absence. So you might have the nanny, but your child may need you. Mm. And so, you know, there are... Yeah, money does a lot, but it, it can't do all. That part. So I literally just, got, well, I didn't get rid of her. She kind of quit, but I had an au pair. Mm -hmm. And although I loved the convenience of having a live-in nanny, once she left and I got over the initial shock of like, oh, my God, I'm having to take care of my kids, my old kids, myself, I really started to think like I needed to take care of my own children. Mm -hmm. The crutch that this au pair was providing it was really, although it was convenient, there were so many moments that I would have missed if, you know, if, if she would have stayed. And I think the convenience of, of all of these things sometimes is taking away from the yeah. connection yeah. that we should have with our kids. It definitely is a balance and it's hard because you're a working mother. You know, you are brilliant and talented in your own right, trying to forge your path forward and so you know I'm a mom myself and so I understand that there's give and take and there's sometimes guilt mm -hmm. when when Alas. choice difficult choices have to be be made but no I, I, I feel you on that one so what did you take away from that career path mm -hmm. that you have used now as a mother with your own children yeah. oh, I, I understand the importance of time time is fleeting and I make choices I always with the with that knowledge because so many people who we're working hard and we're working intentionally to be able to have a legacy for our children the the kids aren't the, ki the kids right now need us now too and so I and, and I and I realized that there were a lot of absent parents, not necessarily because they were working, but with, when parents are incarcerated or, you know, the grandparent is raising the child, I saw quite a bit of that. There's always this yearning in the children. And per, when particularly where girls were concerned, there's always this seeking for that love and that nurturing. And I have a, um, a son and he has special needs. So that's a whole host of, of other um, layers of challenges that I have to deal with, but I just really value that time and that connection. That's such a good point. I remember um, seeing Layla Ali somewhere and she was talking about her experience growing up, how to the world her father was just like this great man, but she didn't know that man. Mm -hmm. Like she did not get yeah. that greatness that these strangers got because he was out being great for the world. Right. And I think so often we're so focused on making a better life for our kids that we're not focused on this life right now yeah. that they're living yeah. and really being active and intentional. Right. And we're thinking that we could just buy them the world, but no, they won't you. They yeah. don't care about 
all of that stuff. And you know what I see? I see people throw that word around a lot, intentional. I mean, we got to be intentional about this. We got to be you intentional. You annoy with it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, no, I, I, but I, I feel that it's, it's just become a word that people say. It's, just throw, it's, 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 it's thrown it's around. It doesn't hold any weight anymore. Right. It's it sounds like it sounds good. You know, just like mindfulness. But really, those are strong and important concepts that we should incorporate. And it's not something glib that we, you know, okay, I'm going to be intentional. But how is that? How does that demonstrate itself? in the way that you connect with those that you love, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? So you mentioned you have a special needs um, mm -hmm, son. Mm -hmm. I feel like the motherhood conversation is either for new moms, postpartum, we talk about postpartum, we talk about pregnancy, infertility, all of those things. I don't really hear the special needs mom mm -hmm. ever entering the chat. Right. It's a lonely place. I can imagine. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I have close friends who I'm just like, mom period is rough. Yeah. Add on that extra layer and it's like, how? Yeah. And I truly mean how. Yeah. Yeah. So for a, whether you're a single mom, your partner, whatever it is, for a, mo a special needs mom out there, any words of wisdom, encouragement, your experience, something yeah. that you wish, you know, you would have learned sooner, like what, just so that they can be included in the conversation. Yeah. I, I think it's important because when, when our children are developing and if you feel like something is not quite right, there, what, what I've seen in, and um, what I've experienced myself and in, in, um, seen in conversations with, with others is that people talk them out of what their instincts are. So, no, it'll be it'll be okay. You know, boys develop slower than girls, you know, whatever it is that these these things that we say largely because we want to, you know, pacify mm -hmm. to to you know we we don't want to face it and so we we try to smooth it over. I would say to any uh person out there who has a child who they're they're questioning if things are the way that they should be to follow your instinct and seek support you know talk first to your pediatrician sometimes the pediatricians will miss it too but the moms don't miss it mm -hmm. the moms recognize that and once you have your a, a child who has been diagnosed whatever their special needs are to find a community and it's sometimes those communities are hard you know nowadays thankfully there are some that are online with that provide uh, vital information so you can be informed but the there there are so many uh challenges along the way and you're right when you say they're missing from the chat uh, a lot of times they're missing from the chat because they're in a corner trying to figure, figure it out, out figure it out can i ask you what was the what were the signs yeah so my my son um in, initially the first thing that we saw was that he was having seizures and uh, it was, which is Ooh, really devastating. How, how young? De devastating to watch. He was less than two. Oh man! And so that was one thing. And then um, we recognized that he was he he had started to talk and then start then regressed. regressed. And then um, after that, then you know it's he, he was very picky and so. But because he was during the, the the early stages he was making all of the the milestone everybody wanted to push it aside but no you know i i, I wasn't going to push it aside so i had him in all the the therapies i did research and so you know which which my my work world really helped me in this case because after i um was a mental health counselor i returned to school earned my phd and i'm a, a social and behavioral scientist and my work is in research and so i used all my skills to learn as much as i could about what were the best practices in the field what were the things that were shown to be effective and i got him in all those therapies and this was before you know anybody they they people weren't even assessing their child pre two years old and particularly a lot of black people mm -hmm. have to wait till they go to school to get a diagnosis for their child the yep. teacher will recognize that you know what 
little Johnny. So he's not. Yeah, something is. Mm -hmm. Might want to get that checked right, out. And right. so, so my background is in education. I taught second mm -hmm. and third grade, and mm -hmm. I remember the IEP meetings. Yes. And these parents didn't know anything to be able to advocate for them yep. for their child. Mm -hmm. And when you don't know what you don't know, you show up in those meetings and you are dictated to. Yep. They tell you what's yep. about to happen. Mm -hmm. And this is your baby. Yep. And I think so often, whether we're talking about, even when you're pregnant, not being able to advocate for yourself. Yep. Black people especially, we gotta stop feeling like the doctor is the end all be all. Yes. Like the doctor, the principal, the police, anybody with authority, we feel like they know better for us no, and for our family than no. we do. And we sometimes, a lot of times, are handing over our control. Mm -hmm. You're handing over your child. Yep. Literally, the health of your child, the future of your yep. child, to someone who does not have that 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 buy-in. Someone yes. who does not really truly they say they care, but they are not, they're not gonna have to pick up the pieces right. of what happens here, of the decision that's made. And so I think so it's so important that we don't you know, as you said, just let people tell us yeah. what's about to happen or yeah. what's going on. And we as women, like how many times have you been to the doctor, home girl? <laughs> and you like, doctor, something ain't right. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but something is, I'm telling you, yeah. something is not right. And that doctor will look you right in your face and say, no, that's normal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that's not what it, yeah. you know? And so that's it's that same said. feeling of like, no, mm -hmm. I know. Exactly. You cannot tell me that this is normal. Mm -hmm. And we have to be willing to get a second opinion and yeah. go to a different doctor and push the issue because mm -hmm. it could be life or death. Absolutely, absolutely. So you went from I'm I'm like following your career path yeah. here. Okay, <laughs> so so did your son? Was that experience what led you to going back to school, or did that come no. first? No, I it came first. And what led me to go back to school was going in those homes and seeing the patterns and wondering what were the connecting threads. Why is it that we have a disproportionate amount of black youth, because I was working with the, the kids in the juvenile justice system. Why are so many of, of them black? Why are so many of the people who look like me precariously housed? Why why are the dads in, in jail? Why are the moms not nurtured? What is going on here? And so I really just had a desire to understand what was the system at play? Because what from my perspective, what I was seeing, I'm like, this cannot be chance and so remember you know i came from jamaica i went to high school i went to to college you know so that was the the experience but now i'm an adult in the world navigating it and i'm like something's, something's, not, something's right. not right and so when i went back to school it was because i wanted to find a way to address social outcomes and so I earned my doctoral degree, which equip equipped me to do that. It was a multidisciplinary degree that drew from criminal justice, social work, public affairs, and health um, informatics and research. And so it allows me to take a cross-sector approach at examining problems. Because when you look at people, we're, we're, we're whole people, and we're impacted by a system that's connected, and we're using different language. You know, so we call it, uh, you know, disproportionate um, contact with the criminal justice system. You have achievement gaps in, in school. You, you have all of these things. And when you really think about them, you have um, disparities in health outcomes. It's the same phenomenon mm -hmm. with the same undercurrent driving it, right? What is that that's driving it? It's, it's, it's the social determinants. It's structural racism. <laughs> it's... The it's, way the system is designed? Yeah, the way the system is designed. So what do we do? Because, let me tell you, I am not the type of person that wants to sit up here and have all these conversations about the problem. Yep. What's the solution? What yep. can not just... I feel like also a part of the challenge with the black community is we are very much individualized. Like, yep. I only care about my child, mm -hmm. my family, mm -hmm. my house. Mm -hmm. But we have to be more that village mindset, that community. So as a community, what can we do? You know, I think that it's important for us to recognize where our strengths are and lead movements, micro-movements, within our sphere of influence. 
you know, it's like, so we might not have a platform that reaches, you know, like you have a platform that's that's very huge. But, you know, everybody might not have that platform. I don't have that platform. But you know what I did? As an entrepreneur who, um, in looking at the data, recognized that uh, the black women are starting all these businesses, and these businesses are fledgling, that we're making $24,000 a year, you know, um, you know, as compared to $198,000 by, by other people. I said, you know, what can I do? I'm, my head is I'm knee deep in disparities data. Everything I look at on a day-to-day -day basis is telling me that there's something wrong. And so, you know, I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find a way to teach people the path that I have taken with my consulting firm. Because when I went back to school and earned my doctoral degree, I decided that I wanted to focus on work that mattered to me. And the, the way that I found to do that was through consulting. And so all the, the dollars that come into my company are through contracts, whether through corporations, governmental entities, or otherwise. And I realized that this is something that I taught myself to do. Nobody wanted to show me anything. I, I've been a consultant. I've owned my company since 2008, right? Donkey years ago. And I'm still here. So I decided, you know what? I'm going to teach some women how to do this. It's, it's small. It's micro, right? But what if I teach some people and then they, they go on and, they, and, and they teach some people and then not and the impact will not only be on their lives but they those who they employ and their families and mm -hmm. their communities mm -hmm. what what can we do so sometimes i think that we take ourselves out of the solution creation process because we feel that it has to be grand. I have to change the whole world or I'm not even gonna get yeah. started. And you know, so I did the first cohort of the Grand Sun Contracts Incubator, it ended in March. And just yesterday I found out that the third contract was awarded to one of, the, it was a small group, like 12 or 13 women, because I what I wanted to do, I knew would be intense and take a lot of my time. But I see it already working mm -hmm. and I, I feel so, proud of of that so in addition to the work that i'm doing to in the community through my contracts to help to design interventions that are culturally responsive gender responsive i'm also doing a little part to try and give a sister help who you can help yeah so i was doing my research and we got to talk about i want to talk about the contracts but we got to talk about these grants because what you got over three hundred thousand dollars in grants. I can't remember if it was three forty nine, three six nine. I did read it though. Yeah, in your that first was, year of business. Yeah, how? <laughs> you know, it's um, it's it's actually not that hard. You know, it's so the work that I do is designed to impact communities, right? And so, if you are doing work that is seeking to improve an outcome there there are dollars for that you know there's 500 billion dollars of years a billion dollars in grant funding a year through the federal government we're not talking about the state government we're not talking about all the local municipalities so there's a lot of money out there and, and this is not just nonprofit no my my company's not nonprofit my company's a for-profit corporation so you have grants you have cooperative agreements and you you have contracts and so there and and there are contracts as well designed to help you to implement whatever it is that you you want to do program i saw i saw i saw funding the other day that you know they were looking to buy 12 rhesus monkeys and some sheep there's i'm telling you there's contracts for toilet paper there's contracts for consulting there's contracts for mental health there's contracts for monkeys what is and needed grants. what's what are the prerequisites is it different from contracts to grants they're, they're they are similar and that's why i teach uh, i teach the, the the process jointly but the, the process, the, the first thing that any individual would need to do would be to register their business with the federal government. Okay. And it's free. That is the SAM.gov. SAM.gov. You, you cannot apply for grants on grants.gov 
until you register on sam.gov. Sam. Okay. okay. So the the you know you can search for the grants, but you have to you have to have your entity registered on sam.gov to be able to apply for funding through grants.gov. And it's it's a it, you know the the most tedious part is the searching because there's so much. It's not the absence. Of, of opportunities that make people overwhelmed is that there's so much and when you're first starting it's it's hard to filter and and process but it's a skill that you build over time i would encourage everyone who is a small business owner to explore get grants and contracts from the federal oh, I'm, government i'm i'm a, I'm a it's been probably five years I've been playing around with this Sam.gov thing. I'm not even going to lie to you. And putting in applications for certification. All the, do I need to be certified? You know, I, I still am not. I would tell people. I have no, I'm not, I don't. In, in Sam, in, in yeah, and I've been doing this since 2008. The women who are in, in um, the, the current cohort and the past cohort, I taught, I told them that, yes, they should they should go after the certifications that they're qualified for. And that's because... As of last year, they increased the target for um, contracts and funding awarded to businesses that meet a certain criteria. And so you'll be able to designate yourself as such. But what people are not aware of is that you you self-certify in SAM.gov. So you designate yourself as a member of these. I'm black. I'm a woman. Yeah, I'm yeah exactly. I'm... Exactly. And so, and and so the 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 SBA process is a is a is a vetting process. So you you know it, it gives you a certain uh, amount of credibility in your business. I've been doing it so long and have in a past performance where it's it you know I you don't need that. You <laughs> you got some respect on your name. But, but yeah. So for someone coming in new. Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of it, even these questions I'm asking you, I'm sure you can see a lot of this is like the limiting beliefs. It's like, mm -hmm. well, I didn't even know that that was possible. So yeah. because it's not possible, I didn't even attempt it. Yeah. Which I think we miss out on so many opportunities because we don't even try yeah. because we talk ourselves out of yep. it. Um, what realistically, I guess, because I'm like, I'm not going to apply for a grant. Like, why would yeah. I apply for a grant? I'm not going to get a grant. Is it you easier are. to get a grant versus a contract? Is no, it easier to get a contract versus a grant? I'm, tell, I'm telling you, they're... they're, they're they're cousins or twins. They're they're friends who love each other. The the, you sh the the path and the process is very similar, and so as you're exploring one, it's it's like anything. You know, it it they go together. Okay. So I explore opportunities for both. You know, and so there's there's also cooperative agreements, which is another. Um, type Another of funding option. which is similar to a grant except that there is a lot of involvement by the funder so they might have evaluators who work with you or they might connect you to resources that they want you to offer um, to your community and so on whereas grants are more independently administered and then you have to do reports and and so on so <laughs> So three of those things you should be looking at. Oh, I will be. I, I was checking out your um, your training on your website. Mm -hmm. I was I was looking into it. I said three hundred thousand dollars in the first year because one of those yeah, limiting beliefs was the nonprofit thing. That was one. Even though I do have a nonprofit, um, but I thought that you know like only nonprofits no. could get grants. Mm -mm. And then the actually writing of the grant because yeah. it really I think comes down to knowing how yeah. to submit this you can application do it because you, you because you are a teacher so they they provide you with everything you need to know and include the reason why people don't do well is because they don't read <laughs> because they they're they're, they're intimidated by a 60 page notice of funding opportunity girl that sounds very intimidating but it's not it looks okay listen there's a lot of things that intimidate me but but what's not going to intimidate me is trying to apply for $750,000 you like or, I'm gonna figure that yeah, out um, you see what I'm saying so if 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 the thing the barrier between me and that is 60 pages I'm gonna read them 60 I'm pages. gonna read those 60 am pages. I gonna comprehend the 60 pages yes you will because the the thing is the the one thing that the government does well is that they're going to tell you exactly what it is that they're looking for. And so if we have a basis of understanding, mm -hmm. then whatever we develop will be designed to respond to, to that with gotcha. specificity. 
So you can do it. So you're because just following it's like your rubric or whatever you you use in the classroom. Yeah. Got you. Okay. That's that's called in in the grants and, and contracts world is is your evaluation criteria. So you look to the evaluation criteria page. I tell, you know, I, I break down to how you use the information that they're telling you they're going to use to score you and create your proposal skeleton. How long is the average proposal? 60 pages? No, actually, no. Actually, the, the notices, um, the solicitation notice or notice of funding opportunity or RFP, whatever, resp- re- request for proposal, they call it a lot of different things are usually longer than what you're required to submit. So a lot of times you'll see 20 pages um, is, is very common, sometimes 30 pages minus the attachments. So you'll have to, uh, you know, attach various things. You might have letters of support, you know, um, oh. resume of, for personnel who you might use and things like that. I got to get out of my own way because all of that sounds like intimidating. It's, it's, it's intimidating because you're not, because I've never done it before. Right. Exactly. And so there's always a, a, a certain amount of trepidation. You know, you're, you're like, oh, my God. But then for me, at this point, you know, I, I told um, the ladies last week, at this point, I'm unemployable. Right? That part. Because I have no choice. I can't go work for nobody. No. And so and, and there is the money that we are going after is small money in the scheme of things. You're looking for a million, a couple million, you know. A little million here yeah. there. Yes, I am yeah. actually. Where you, are you, little million? You know, but but I'm saying I'm not I'm not trying to no, I, be I funny. Get what you're but in, in, in the, the grand scheme of, scheme of things, of things this th- little million. They're trillions of dollars. <laughs> so okay, so let's say, and I know this varies, but my curiosity is yeah. when I see people say, Okay, I got a million dollar contract for twelve months, so yada yada, whatever. How much are they really getting out of that million? Because yeah, you got to take that and hire the people yeah, and do the yeah, things. Yeah, and- so it, it depends on, on are you selling products or are you selling services and so on. So it depends. You know, so it's it, you, when, when you think about anything that you're going to undertake, when you're thinking of should I respond to this proposal, you look at the uh, they have what's called a funding ceiling and then they have the funding floor. Okay. The least you can, um, they want you to request, and the most that you can okay. request on any. So there's parameters. Yeah, there, there's parameters, and so when you're thinking about the product, process, service that you have in mind, then you're looking at the dollars, and you're looking at what they're asking you to do, and you're looking at the budget to see if it makes sense. Gotcha. Not everything makes sense. But a lot of it out there does make sense. Mm. And so you might go after, you know, a, a three year, four million dollar funding opportunity. Does that all of that come in your pocket? No, it shouldn't, because you have to got to do, you the thing. do the, you have to do the thing. And you you may not be as a sole proprietor able to do the things all by yourself. So you would need like sub sub subcontractors right right yeah you can use you you know you can have um, people contracted staff you can have if you have staff within your own organization and so they will have to be compensated but you are in this business for a profit you know so your price is the cost plus your profit got you what is the biggest difference or process how how is the process difference between government contracts and corporate contracts yeah, you know what I've found is that in on the corporate side is that the the contracting process is a little bit has been a little bit simpler in my experience. Hmm. Um and so, you know, it's there's not a whole down the road and through the valley and over um the mountains. For me, the process the process has been fairly um simple and because from my experience the, the folks who have contracted me for my services have been leaders of departments of large entities. So they, there's more f- flexibility in what they can and do or like how the they're, decision maker. they're the decision makers. Gotcha. And so, so even if you contract, you know, you, you were an educator, even if you were, you were supposed to get contracts with school systems or, or um, depending on what you're looking for funding for, some, some schools are site managed and so the principal is in charge. So mm-hmm. it's easier once you develop relationships to get opportunities Versus like that. something that has to get approved by the school board or red, right. a lot of red tape. Right. Got you. Right. Okay. Right. So there's different paths for everyone. And I w- it's, not, it's not harder than anything else. 
everything that we do, there's a hard, there's going to be a hard some way, you know, this is the hard that I've chosen. And I, and I actually don't feel that it's hard. What I feel that it's, you have to, you have to pay attention. You have to be responsive to detail. You have to move with integrity. You have to provide services in excellence because when you do that, then you are making the path to your next contract shorter because now people are coming to you, mm -hmm. right? Instead of you always having to, you know. Okay, so if there's somebody out there watching with limiting a limiting belief around, well, all of that sounds good, but what could I do? What are some of the skills or some of the services or some of the things that someone out there watching might already be qualified you, to do? They're just you not thinking about it. You can do anything. I'm telling you, when, when I say anything, I mean anything. When you think about the government, the government gets people to do the things that they need to do mm -hmm. from roads and bridges to janitorial services to property management you know to you know research and evaluation to mental health to um, podcasting mm -hmm. Podcasting. They, you see they, a podcast you know, contract? Well, you know, I'll look for you. Girl, when look I go for back. me once. Let, see what's out there. I'll, I'll look because they, you know, the other day I was looking at, um, they were looking for photography and social media marketing for, for an embassy overseas or, you know, um, someone to do something in Rome. So there, there's. Oh, There's so this opportunities. Isn't just, this is global. This is global because the, Uni the United States government it's has global. presence. Got you. Yeah, that was it. Mm -hmm. That was. And question. actually, Don't talk once, about you, me in the comments. once you start going, once you start doing this work, then you'll start to explore opportunities that are overseas because eighty-five percent of the dollars I leave in the country are are are, are overseas. You mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you only do what you do or do or because I've talked to people who are in the government contracting space and they started out doing one thing and then they realize that it really boils down to being like a project manager and then they start doing or I'm, do you stay like in your lane? I'm in my lane f firmly and I, I um, suggest that people, particularly if you're just starting, do the same. I stay in my lane and I will stay in this lane because I really enjoy my work. So I do four things, research, evaluation training and technical assistance around a core my, my core competence right gotcha. and so i don't do anything outside of that i don't look for anything outside of that because the reason i chose this path is because i really want to impact change in the community in this space right this gotcha. is this is what this is what i want to do this is what moves me and so when i do it it's it might be long hours sometimes but i never feel like dang, I can't stand what I'm doing. I really enjoy what I'm doing. And so, no, I, I teach the ladies in the cohort core competence. Don't, we, we see social media. I see a lot of things on social media. You know, you get, get a LLC and then get you Airbnb, do this. And, get a Toro. Yeah. Get a, go get, yeah. And, and, then, and then you get a co contract and you sub it out and you take the, the, the money. You know, first of all, some of that, some of the things that they're saying are illegal. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it is you know? illegal. <laughs> they're going to jail. A lot of y'all are going to jail. <laughs> the feds like, is watching. They are. They are. They're watching on they these are. podcasts. Y'all ain't not up in here, though. <laughs> not up in here. Okay? Not up in here. Yeah. Very good info, though, um, because I do think that we are missing out on so many opportunities yeah. because we're stuck in this one way of yeah. doing it. And I don't know about you, but I'm starting to notice and feel this shift of, like, the social media entrepreneur is starting to... It's starting to be over with. Yeah. Like, you can't just get on in Instagram and make your whole income anymore. No. That is... Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, and, and that's what I say. It's like, you know, I just showed up over here. <laughs> it's like I've been told, you know, you have to be here. But that's that's not my world of work, right. you know? Like, I'm doing um, real work in, in the real, real life. In, yeah. ex exactly, in a real community yeah. Yeah. for real governments and yeah. real corporations, you know? So, but I would say to the woman who is sitting there and wondering if she can, yes, yes, you can. And the thing that is pulling you that you're moving away from or, or pushing back is the thing that is the seat of your power, mm. right? And, and that is the basis of the funding that you'll get. If you can find work that's in alignment with that thing that makes you tick, mm. 
I'm getting excited thinking about it because we spend we waste a lot of time doing doing things that we're not interested in yep. that we're not excited about that we have no desire to do based on what we think we have to do based on survival mode based on outside influences and if you can find that sweet spot of like what really really like gives you joy what brings you passion and it gets you paid yes that's what we're looking it's for it's a beautiful thing it's so a beautiful you're gonna thing. walk them into the promised land when is your next cohort you know, <laughs> I don't, not till next year. <laughs> I'm, I'm, now, you didn't just do did all this teasing. <laughs> no, it's, you know, it's like people, but, but, but you remember how you just asked me, or do, 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 I'm, I'm not just teaching about this. This, I'm, I'm You're actually, living this. I'm, I'm living this. And, and I love my life. That's why I'm going back home right after I leave here, because my bed is comfortable. Right, so you and like so, y'all gotta get in where you fit in because I'm yeah, really doing no, this. No, I I I was I did one and it was beautiful and I did the second one and it's beautiful. I haven't set the date for the third one, but I do have a waiting list. Okay, and so people can sign up for that if they um, want to be made aware uh, of it. But there 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 are you know and sometimes I do question and answer session where it's it's an hour or more of me really just answering people's questions and specific questions about. What path can they take, or does this make sense, or you know? But what I the, the key thing that I would say is that there are resources that are available that are at no cost to register on sam.gov. There's no cost to that. When you go on Google and you search it, you're going to see companies that pop up that say six hundred or a thousand dollars. You don't do that. You register for free. You go to grants.gov for free. You register for that for free, and you start learning you just playing around with it i t i say scroll for dollars the, if you if you want that feel of just scrolling down like you do on instagram go on grants.gov go on sam.gov and scroll through the opportunities you know it will help you it, it'll inspire it'll you. It'll probably open up your mind yeah. to what's possible. Because, yeah. again, we think we have to sell one-to-one. -one. I got to start a lash line. Yeah. I got to, you know, we, we're all doing the same thing. I start a T-shirt company. I got to, same thing over and over, and we're missing out on so much If money. you want to start a T-shirt company, start the T-shirt company, but don't sell one off. Go on sam.gov and get a contract. And sell a thousand T-shirts? They got T-shirt contracts? Yes. Mm. Because think about all the think about the military and their uniforms and they're, when they're jogging on the street and it says U.S. Army, they buy that from a contractor. Mm. They mm. buy the shorts, the little ROTC outfits that the kids in high school. One of the persons in the incubator um, was just looking at that. It's there. There's. there's it's there. Everything that you sell, they're buying it. Yeah, there there was a, a contract that I just saw the other day for a cosmetology cosmetology instructor mm. so it's there the we are talking ourselves out of a path the path to freedom is what it really sounds like and let's full circle moment if we go back around to slavery it's time to get your money back okay, okay. all of that money that we uh, that money back, okay? That the country that you built on your back, it's time for them to pay you back. Yeah. And we could drop the mic on that. So I don't even know. You could send the people to your website, but it ain't nothing there for them. <laughs> but the wait list, unless you got a contract, <laughs> unless you got a contract. Uh, yeah, I don't sell to to. Be, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, where can they find the wait list? Oh, where can on, they find you online? On, yeah, they can go to Dr. Loren D R L A U R E N. J O S E P H S, Dr. Loren Josephs on Instagram. And, and, and don't even stuff. go to the website. Yeah. She ain't or got I'm nothing. on LinkedIn too, because that's where. If mm -hmm. you got, that's where she hangs out with the big coins, <laughs> with the contracts, with the coins, baby. So if you got a contract for Dr. Loren, yeah. holla at your girl. If you got a contract for me, holla <laughs> at me, okay? Speaking that thing into existence, I have enjoyed you. I, 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 so much good information. Yeah, I love Let it. me in the next cohort. Yep, come on. Okay, I'm even on the wait between, list. I'll, 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 I'll tell you. I can't I'll... wink, but <laughs> look, even in between, your girl get it where she fit it. And yeah. listen, y'all already know when I find out new information, I'm bringing it to you. Yeah. So don't be hating, cause I'm gonna get in where I fit in. Okay, I'm gonna come right back here and tell y'all everything I learned because 
truly, all jokes aside, we got to stop playing. Girl, yeah. stop playing, okay? We got to stop playing with our potential. We got to stop playing with our future. We have to stop talking about this generational wealth that's just going to fall out of the sky. And we have to start being intentional and strategic about how we are creating it. So thank y'all for tuning in to this episode Comment below and let me know something that you've learned because I know you've learned a lot, okay? You might need to hit the replay, go back, rewind it, like drag this thing back so that you can get your notebook out and take some notes on the opportunities that you are about to go apply for right now, today. Sam.gov, grants.gov, follow Dr. Loren on Instagram, and make sure you <laughs> subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on next week's show. I'll see you right back here. Love you. Peace. If you enjoyed that episode, make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any upcoming content and take it a step further and go ahead and join our private community over on Patreon because it comes with some pretty bomb perks, including early and discounted access to our upcoming events, behind the scene exclusives with some of your favorite guests, the opportunity to call in on an upcoming show, the chance to vote on topics and guests for brand new shows, and I'm even giving you unlimited access to my vault of business classes where I'm teaching you everything from Airbnb to developing digital products and everything in between. And you can get access to our Patreon for as little as five dollars a month okay get in where you fit in and i'll see you on the inside peace